first, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Anna Cristalli. I'm a research software engineer at the University of Sheffield and also a core team member of the Reaper Hack project. And for today, there are sort of two, two main links to materials you need. Uh, this, the, the, the link to this document that we're looking at now, and then the hub as well, which is what I'm going to be giving you a guided tour of. So the hub is actually this link here, reaperhack.org, and I can quickly um, show it to you and start, uh, give you a quick introduction to the, um, the project in general. So uh, Reaper Hacks are basically uh, um, reproducibility uh, events, or we, call, we like to call them sandbox environments for practi practicing research reproducibility. And basically what happens is uh, running up to an event, authors will submit papers, code and data. And then on the day, participants will attempt to uh, show you to reproduce the paper from the, uh, the code and data supplied uh, and then record their experiences and feed those back to the authors. So the uh, participants get sort of uh, hands-on experience with real live materials and reproducibility and then authors get feedback uh, on those materials, but it's all designed to be um, a low pressure and formal environment. So it is an opportunity to practice and gain these skills, both as an author and a reviewer. Okay, so quickly, I'll also go through a bit of uh, background history. So, you know, this is our team. And then, we started off in 2016 as a as an open con satellite event, but then the project was expanded as part of my Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship in 2019. And we did a lot of stuff with that, but uh, ultimately one thing we were really interested in is making the events themselves reproducible. So making it easy for other people to be able to run uh, such events. So. Uh, this is why, uh, with the help from the NHCIR as well, we developed uh, this hub, Reaper Hack hub that you're seeing uh, to, to sort of um, uh, facilitate all the activities involved in a Reaper Hack. So this is what I'm going to be giving you a tour of today, the hub, and I'm going to be showing it you from, from three perspectives, really, from participant, organizer, really focusing on the organizer, but also the author, just so you have a, a good overview of um, what the events are and how as organizers, you'd be able to support uh, uh, all, all, all these um, perspectives. And what I thought we could do quickly to start off with is just get a, um, uh, uh, a flavor of the activity. So it's, it's, uh, normally we take a whole day, but we'll try and just do something for five minutes. <laughs> and what I thought we could do is if you uh, go down to this Reaper hacking a paper together, I've put a link to uh, the data and code associated with the paper. Uh, and I thought we could take five minutes, uh, just have a look through it, no need to download it. And uh, I've picked four questions that we have in our review form. Oh, what I should have mentioned is how uh, participants feedback their uh, experiences through a structured review form. So that helps them uh, focus on various aspects of, of what uh, we hope to gain from uh, publishing these materials. So one of these sections is documentation. So what I thought we could do is take five minutes, uh, have a look at the materials and then answer as many questions as you'd like, uh, but think about generally these four questions, uh, you know, uh, how well was material documented? How could it be improved? What did you like? And, uh, and also have a, a look at whether you can find a, a license there as well. So I'm going to set a timer for this, if I can get rid of this one second. There we go. So I'll set, Set a timer for five minutes, and then we can come back and discuss a little bit what you found. Is that good? Excellent. There, off you go.
and yeah, feel free to use the um, the document for uh, uh, recording your answers or your thoughts. Okay, so how did everyone get on? Does someone, would someone like to comment, unmute and comment, or I can read stuff out if there is someone that wants to. 
answer some of these questions? Okay, no problem. Uh, but yeah, I see a lot of uh, interesting comments that we, we sort of know when we do this exercise. Um, uh, our versions and packet versions, yes, that becomes uh, even more so when you actually try and run the code. And I also saw uh, uh, um interesting point about, yeah, that you do have to um, uh, um, modify the script to run. So I believe there's sort of hardwired uh, paths in there. Um, personally, I think at least there's good commenting in the code. You, they, they have commented to say what code uh, um, is doing. Um, overview of analysis and text file was helpful. Yeah. Uh, so overview of analysis and text file was helpful to get oriented. Yes. And yeah, we didn't really um, find a license. Okay. So uh, you'll see when we look at the actual review code that we look at a lot uh, more, but I just wanted to sort of give you a quick flavor of what it is that uh, people do during a, a, a reaper hack. And actually indeed, one thing they'll do is of course, try and download everything and run the code uh, rather than just uh, review it online. So what I'm going to do is uh, now show you how we use the hub to facilitate uh, the activities. And I'll start, given that we started uh, with reviewing from a reviewer's experience, okay, from a participant's experience. So the first thing they need to do is sign up. I'm skipping this part because uh, we've only got an hour. But yeah, to use the hub, you do need to sign up. But then uh, when you're beginning the Reaper hack, the one thing you want to do, the first thing you want to do is find a paper. And for this, we have our uh, paper list. So we have a central paper list that anyone could submit a paper to whenever they like. And these are, for example, papers that have recently been submitted. And um, you have some information here, uh, for example, obviously the title and some talk, uh, some um, a pitch from the authors, if you like, on why you might want to try and reproduce it, uh, as well as some tags. So usually they'll, they'll be more informative than that and have sort of what language they're used in. Uh, and in particular, what you're looking at now is the results of submissions for our recent H first HPC Reaper hack, actually. So this is the central paper list. But as a, um, yeah, this is a central paper list. Uh, some more information you might find is if a paper has already been reproduced, um, you'll find the number of reviews that have been submitted and also a mean reproducibility score among these. So th there is a lot of discussion about this reproducibility score. It isn't something necessarily uh, you're trying to ace. We, we try and explain to authors that it's to help primarily other participants because they often want to know whether they're attempting something really hard. Um, so this is mainly what this is geared for, but sometimes it upsets authors and it is something we're kind of still unsure what to do with, but so far the participants have all said they want it <laughs> and it's useful which is why we kept it uh, there's more information if you do look at the actual paper as well like a, a, a full more of a description and uh, sometimes it provides uh, things to focus on and then all the links associated with the paper one thing to note is that it, that's the central paper list but you can if you have a specific event, you can ask uh, people submitting to your particular event, like this HPC one, uh, which needed to be associated with this event because we had HPC resource associated with it. Uh, they can associate it with an event and then it appears, the papers appear at the bottom of the uh, event page. Okay, so, um, that's a, another uh, place participants can uh, find events. So once they've, uh, sorry, papers. Once they've, you've selected your paper, for example, then you can obviously perform the, the you know, attempt to reproduce it. And once you're ready, you can submit your review. So you can submit it on your own or with a team. 
And these are the questions uh, you can, uh, yeah, you, you say which event it's from, and these are the sort of questions that we're getting participants to, um, we've designed more to get participants to think about the utility of having these materials. Uh, so obviously reproducibility is a big part of it. So, you know, we ask them to, to sort of deter, um, score how much they feel they reproduce, but then this is really the important stuff so describing the procedure they followed, give a background on how familiar they already are. Um, because, you know, a, a user that's not a, do, a domain um, of, of that domain might give different uh, and, and more useful sometimes actually uh, uh, feedback, operating systems, software that they installed and use, and then what challenges they ran into. But we are all, always want them to think about positives as well. Uh, like suggestions as well uh, on re the approach. Can you hear me still? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, same with the documentation. You actually saw the questions that are associated with the documentation section. But then we also like would like them to think about reusability. Sometimes it can be push button reproducible, but then very hard to figure out uh, how to reuse it or how to link things uh, with um, the paper, like which part of the code links to which part of the paper. So we get them to think about reusability uh, and transparency as well in, in these terms. Oh, sorry, I, I think I skipped the transparency bit. Uh, which is uh, here, any suggestion on how it could be made more transparent. Okay, that in effect is the uh, participants' uh, perspective. One thing to note, and I'm not gonna go through it, but we also have participant guidelines where we give yeah, just sort of advice and, and more detail on how to go through it. So I won't go through it one by one. It is in the, a lot of this is in the intro slides that we provide a template for as well. Um, but it's good to familiarize as an organizer with uh, this material uh, before you begin. And there's a nice Turing Institute, yeah, Turing Way uh, graphic as well, obviously. <laughs> okay, so. I'm doing well, I think. So is there any questions at this point uh, about this? We'll have a little bit of time. Is it clear? So I'll put two questions. I'll put sure. a question section at the end, Anna. I've got yeah. two, two sub questions. Sure. When, when you're doing um, reviews mm -hmm. of a paper, is it always solicited or do you do unsolicited feedback? And the yeah. second part to that is, uh, is the feedback always made in a constructive manner as opposed to your paper was really rubbish. Um, yeah. It could yeah. be better if you yeah. did the following kind of thing. So Definitely. So this is part of our uh, code of conduct. And it's one thing in the slides that we provide the organizers and in the organizers guidelines. So I'm going for the second uh, question now. We make a big deal out of that. And we want the organizers to make a big deal out of the fact that you know, participants wouldn't have an activity without these papers, that it's kind of really brave of people to open the materials for other people to work with. And therefore, uh, we only want constructive criticism. So the, 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 what's the word? The tone, right? We really try and make a big deal out of the tone that the, the reviews are gonna take. Um, and, you know, sometimes the participants, when they're feeding back to each other, um, they get frustrated or whatever, but no, it, it, it's no, it should never end up in a review. Uh, it, the review should always be in good faith. So that's just uh, um, from the or that's something we uh, encourage the organizers to make sure that they set like a, a good tone. But yeah, at the minute also, really all the papers are submitted by authors themselves so that already they, it's, a, it's an activity that they want to participate in. Okay, cool, thanks. Anything else at this point? 
Okay, let's move on then to the organizer's perspective. And a lot of the information that I'm gonna go through is actually in the organizer's guidelines. Uh, so we, again, we've tried to make it as detailed as possible uh, to enable people to do this without necessarily coming to one of these train the trainer events, although we're trying to do more of these as well. Uh, but it, it, if at any point you have any suggestions on how they can improve, please let us know. So one thing we can start, we start with, uh, we suggest people start with is this event organizers checklist. And what we provide here is, um, it's, yeah, just a checklist to get you to plan the event. So uh, think about your audience and how you're gonna reach them. You, uh, we often find actually that having a couple of speakers really makes a difference to break up the day. It's not necessary, but it has worked really well in the past. Uh, and then there's also logistics to think about, you know, if you're uh, uh, remote or not, what sort of tech you might need, sort out your agenda and it, any staff or volunteers. And of course, finances. <laughs> so this is a good starting place if you uh, are planning to do one of these events. And once you've had a little think about it, then you can start putting it together. Uh, there are quite a few types of Reaper hacks, if you like. So we have done these event Reaper hacks as part of conferences or at a specific university. We've done remote Reaper hacks and now done a high performance computing Reaper hack as well, which is really interesting. One thing we haven't done ourselves or haven't heard anyone done, but we're really interested because this is where we see it going is, is a sort of research group Reaper hack. So just like you might have a code review in your research group, before someone, a member of the team is gonna publish a paper, that's a great time to get your research group together and see if people can reproduce it. So this is really where we see this going and being a completely normalized activity within academia where we don't even need to be, exist. Uh, but for now, uh, yeah, if, if basically if anyone does this, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, if you decide you're gonna invite speakers, invite your speakers. And then there's a few materials you need to uh, create uh, associated with the event. One thing the hub doesn't do is we don't handle uh, registration. Uh, so you'll need to use uh, some other platform, Eventbrite or, or whatever uh, for that purpose. But we do offer, as you'll see in the uh, event form, um, uh, uh, a field for you to put your registration link in there. Then the two things you, we suggest you need, you don't need necessarily need these, but we, this is how we run them, is an event hack pad, which uh, we have a hack and D template. Let me get rid of some of these uh, right here. So we do have links to HackMD. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically an online uh, platform to share markdown documents um, and we link to tutorials and, and things like that. I won't get into too much detail now, but basically this is a, this is a template for your HackMD. And really the, the, the main thing it's used for is uh, participants sign up it, it, online. You might use icebreaker rooms um, and we get them to name them just for fun. So then when they go back to breakout rooms to work, they can work on the beach. We've had like Docker school on the beach and uh, just, I don't know, various locations just to make it fun. Uh, and then the other, you can also use this to collect notes or questions for uh, speakers if you have speakers. Um, but the main thing is for uh, participants to register what paper they're working on and, and the teams that they're working on, they're working in. So just other participants can see. Um, eventually, obviously, they're going to submit their review, but during the event, this is how uh, people sort of see what others are working on. Uh, yeah, that is the main really purpose uh, of it. And then we ask for some feedback at the end as well. Well, so that is the uh, hackpad. The other thing you might want, or well, we use them as some slides. Uh, just uh, to introduce the event and keep it going. And again, 
we have uh, slide templates, again, in HackMD. So you can use HackMD to, uh, uh, in slide mode. So again, you write a markdown, but then it, uh, it, it's a free slide hosting service. So in effect, what, what we're doing here is, as I mentioned uh, before, Mario, is you set the tone. Uh, okay, you can do some housekeeping, do your introductions in an icebreaker. Now, I, I wish I could have, if we had more time, we would have done this icebreaker uh, uh, between us, but I normally we take two hours for these train the trainer sessions. So sorry, I skipped it. But yeah, we have a little icebreaker session. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, just guiding them through the, the objectives, telling participants the plan of action, and then also giving them tips for reviewing. So here is where we hammer the tone thing. So remind, me, remind them of the code of conduct and then remind them of these additional considerations, you know, that reproducibility is hard and that it's really brave of the authors and that, you know, without them, there would basically be no event. So, uh, and then it's just walking them through a, a lot of the, the rest of it is uh, in the participant guidelines. Uh, so I'm not really going to go through it, but it's just advice on, uh, uh, on things to think about when you're reproducing. Okay. So once you, these are the main sort of materials we prepare before an event, but once that's done, then you can, uh, register your event. So let's go ahead and show that. Well, in fact, let me do it from the, the hub so you can see it. We, you go to events. And then at the top, you can submit an event. And then the, uh, you have an event title, a host, uh, a contact email, if you don't want to use the, the one of the submitter. So I'm signed in. And obviously, I have a uh, email associated with my account. If you wanted to use a, a different contact email, you can supply that here. And then a registration URL. URL for the hackpad and URL for the slides. These are optional uh, if you want to use them. Start and end time and time zone. If it's remote, you can just turn it off, turn the event location off. Uh, otherwise, the address. And then we don't have anything fancy where you can search for the address and then it, it zooms in, unfortunately. So there's a little bit of manual. Uh, uh, zooming in to find the location, but you, you can just put a marker. So it, it would be not eventually, hopefully we'll have something like that, but uh, we don't at the minute. Uh, and then once the, the basic sort of metadata about the event is done, then you have your event, which what we've done is we've already provided a, um, a markdown, template. Oh, one thing I didn't mention before, when we were looking at the reviewers forms, they're all marked down the uh, fields. So people can write in in markdown and format code snippets and error messages and things like that, um, which we thought was really cool. Uh, so we provide this template that people can edit as they wish. They can just keep it or, or edit it, but it does have the basics of um, what we generally do in, in a, in a repro hack. And it also has this uh, template agenda as well. So this is really how a typical event goes. Welcome and orientation, icebreaker. We might have some talks. Then we go through those tips and tricks for reviewing. Then folks have some time to select papers, chat, coffee. Normally that's a coffee break where people uh, either can go into breakout rooms or in person, it's even better. They can just mingle and, and start having chats about potential papers. Uh, then we normally have round one of Reaper hacking. And before lunch, we try and get the group back together to have a regroup and share how they're getting on. Lunchtime, then it, people Reaper hack for the rest of the afternoon, having a coffee break in between. Again, you might have another talk. And then Im importantly, at the end, we regroup and share experiences. Do leave some time for that because people tend to 
uh, have a lot to say uh, and really enjoy this se section. Um, but by the end, we also asked the participants to have filled in ideally their uh, review form as well. Um, and that's it. The, the rest is just sort of guidance for the uh, participants, which I mean, it has already most of the instructions, but um, individual organizers, if they want to tweak any of this, they, they can. Then that's it. We, we, we press submit. So before I do that, I'm just going to go, I'm actually going to go back to the resources. So once you've registered your event, you um, will uh, likely want to promote the event. So get uh, potential authors involved, uh, potential participants, and then to uh, make use of the social media as well. So I thought um, one thing we like to do is brainstorm this, this section a little bit. Um, well, this section in the running event. So I have some brainstorming questions that potentially we could, uh, that we can take a few minutes to uh, complete. And the questions I've got are, let me go back to here actually. Uh, in fact, one thing to, to note before is, I should have mentioned it is, I just want to point out the code of conduct as well. So, uh, as I'm, I think uh, we have our basic uh, code of conduct and we have our, how we report things, but uh, where is it? I think we have a very uh, specific section about authors. Yeah. So the, we've sort of added uh, just a specific section about how to treat authors and how to give a good review. But apart from the code of conduct, we elaborate, we hammer that in uh, during the introduction and uh, when welcoming participants. Okay, so the questions we have, and we can just have a, a discussion, is what communication channels would people consider to attract participants uh, if you're planning an event? Then this is an interesting one that we come up with often. How would you try and convince a colleague neighbors? This is always a useful one to share with others. Um, and then whether you might, I mean, they might be the same communication channels, but uh, whether you might consider different channels for uh, attracting paper donations to attracting participants. So yeah, we can either discuss or people can take a couple of minutes and think about it. Oh, I see hands up. Um, let's go with Heather. Hi, I just have a question about the code of conduct. Yes. Um, is is the code of conduct committee a, a central reprohack um, body, or is this something that organisers would need to gather and you know? No, no, no. So it's it's yeah, it's our team, the reprohack core team. Okay. Cool. Uh, we are considering whether we should allow uh, individual organisers to be able to add an additional contact. So then there's two, you know, if it's something to do with us, they, people can send their um, um, concerns to a local contact and then the, the opposite as well, or they might just want to uh, speak to uh, um, or, or contact a local contact, but we, we haven't got that far yet, but that's something we are considering and any input uh, or your opinions on that would be gr greatly appreciated. Just to quickly uh, add to that, so, so is, is your committee then uh, a global committee? I mean, would there be sort of a bit of a delay in response? I mean, you're not available 24-7, I guess. No, we have, well, uh, one of our members is in the US. <laughs> but no, we're not, we're not really a rapid response team. And we are a really small uh, team. So this is something that is admittedly challenging. Um, how to make this really, you know, formal and uh, because we're just a volunteer, we are 
you know, a small volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. um, we do understand that it's really important. We are struggling, if I'm honest, to, you know, we haven't had anything yet, but yeah, it, it's, it's something that I think is difficult and challenging for small projects like this that actually want to be big. So mm -hmm. I imagine if we got funding, that is something that would be a, a more, you know, there'd be a formal uh, um, allocation if you, if you like for that. But yeah, at the minute, we're kind of doing what we can. Okay, thanks. Yes, and I see another uh, hand from Vicky. Hi, I feel like maybe you covered this and I've just missed it, but for the papers, do they have to be, like the authors submitting the papers, do they have to be published in a journal or can they be unpublished papers? Oh, I, yeah, I should have mentioned that actually. We think actually that a preprint stage is a great time. And we do say that in the, uh, oh, oh, yeah, I haven't said it because I will say it, okay. <laughs> Um, when we, because we're going to look at a little bit the author's perspective as well, and uh, yeah, we think preprint is actually the best time to do this. Um, I, I, I mean, you could do it by just sticking a, a, a um, document, like a, a sorry word document, up if you wanted. But uh, yeah, I think you're more you're closer to it, uh, your final output. I feel when you've got a preprint, so actually, we think that's the best stage. At the minute, yeah, we we want the authors to be involved. So we do advertise it as something for authors to to do to for themselves to get benefit. Um, it is, yeah, we're not trying to catch people out. We're not trying to, uh, you know, uh, find all the all the papers that are out there that say they're reproducible and not. Although, to be fair. It, not, to, not that we're trying to catch people out, but we are worried as a, as a, and why this project exists is that if nobody engages with these materials or checks them, then who knows? We're just publishing stuff, making it open, but is it fit for purpose? Are we actually gaining uh, all the benefits that we are, think we are going to gain when we open everything up? And we feel that until someone engages with it, material, who knows? <laughs> you know, it, maybe. So that's yeah. kind of what the, the um, at, at the same time we recognize we're still, nobody's training people uh, formally on what to open up, how to do it. And that's why we call this a sandbox environment, if you like, that potentially could lead on to being a code checker, for example, for the code check. But we want this to be informal. It's, it's just practice. Yeah, well, you're, you're just here to practice. Yeah, I think that makes sense because I think under that like arguments to convince people to submit their paper, if it's not already at a journal, then it means they get feedback that they can actually incorporate before yeah. they go on to publish and the paper. We've had really good feedback from authors, actually, because it's just amazing until someone actually tries it. And these are authors that think, you know, they're into reproducibility and think their papers are reproducible, right? But until someone tries it, you really just don't know what you've forgotten. Even the key, the, actually the most common things are missing documentation. There's just so many assumptions made when you publish stuff that when someone actually tries to work with stuff, it, it just a few lines of extra documentation would uh, go you know, a really long way. Yeah, I think that makes sense. The other thing I was gonna ask is, do you think you get more reproducible papers submitted to then like the standard paper because like you said if you're going to submit to this as an author you're probably like yeah quite into reproducibility already well yeah they are they're high you know compared to any average paper they are more reproducible yeah yeah they are <laughs> thank you that was uh, really helpful um, I guess uh, so I think I don't know if anyone wants to comment on the communication channels and I think maybe we we discuss the questions and I'll uh, I'll leave on one thing I'll say is I'll just say what we use and that's Twitter and uh, any mailing lists uh, appropriate mailing lists we tend to uh, target for both participants and paper donations and I think we're we've we just kind of discussed it 
arguments to convince colleagues, but perhaps we can return to this at the end because I think it's a really interesting uh, uh, topic. Um, but I just want to make sure I show you the final perspective, which is, oops, oh yeah, it's up here. So the final perspective is the, the authors, right? So uh, again, we have, and I'm going to go to that, some author guidelines, which are structured a bit more like a QA. and a And this is where we try and lay out uh, some of the questions they, uh, answers to some of the questions they might have. So uh, what are the benefits of having my paper reviewed? Some tips on preparing their materials. And this is stuff that we've learned uh, from, uh, from repro hacks, actually, seeing what the, the most common uh, reviews are. Actually, one thing I should mention, and maybe I'll, I'll mention it when I show you the paper uh, uh, form, is that um, if the paper author or one of the reviewer is not happy with the review being public, it's not public, right? So if you're, you know, want to keep reviews private or um, uh, you're a reviewer and you don't really want your review public, you, you can, uh, you know, both of them have to say they're happy with the reviews being public for them to be public. Why should you submit your paper? Uh, how can you make it easier to find? Um, associating with a single event. This one we tried to, uh, so what if I'm not happy with my reproducibility score? Yeah, we've just tried to uh, give them some tips. Some authors get a little bit attached to that. And there isn't a standard. One thing I'll say is this isn't a standardized uh, score. It's really hard to, you know, we try and give our best advice to, to participants um, and try and prepare the authors as well. But, you know, we have had maybe one or two authors not happy with the reproducibility score, but... <laughs> We try and explain that we're not, it's not really a grade, it's, it's that it's more for participants and we do offer some things that we could, that they could do. Um, <laughs> and one thing that they can do is there's a private uh, section under each review that only the author and the reviewer uh, can, uh, can see. So they can uh, engage with each other and discuss, and maybe even they can make some, uh, you know, address some of the comments and maybe the reviewer will then change the score because that, that we don't, yeah, that's allowed. Um, but yeah, really, we, we, we try and get them to not be that fussed about them. <laughs> um, yeah, how they can communicate with the reviewers, that's the comments section. And the, uh, how to keep things private. They can turn off email notifications for both comments and reviews if they don't want to be emailed. That's how normally you get uh, notified when a review is submitted. Uh, some advice on proprietary service uh, software, and then the age because we get this uh, uh, we get we got this often. What about if my paper requires a lot of compute? We do say you know it's difficult. Um, there there is the advice that um, uh, Daniel gave about uh, things requiring a lot of computation that you can have a mini example. But, but what we're gonna write up soon is how this pilot of a HPC Rebro hack went and actually it was really successful. Uh, and it, it took, we took 10 days and had um, a, a portion of one of the tier two uh, um, HPC clusters available to us and yeah, the, the students really enjoyed it. Some managed to reproduce, some didn't, but it did seem a, a valuable uh, practice all around, both um, learning about HPC and also finally digging in to some of these papers that have been, you know, in terms of checking reproducibility, almost considered out of bounds, like forget about it. You're never gonna check that. Well, it is possible as such an activity, um, it, yeah. Okay, the, those are the author guidelines. And then the, um, once you, you uh, have a paper to submit, this is a, quite a short uh, form. And these are the sort of details that you're asked. 
If there's a specific event that you want to uh, associate it with, you can pick it there. Otherwise, it'll go to all events, to the central paper list, although you can have them in both. So title, authors, a uh, citable reference, so a text reference, and then if you want, um, you can add a bib tech uh, reference. I think this is for later for if we uh, one uh, are able to analyze it. And so, you know, having a machine readable reference, DOIs, short description of a paper. Why should someone attempt it? This is what appears on the paper list. So this is where you sort of make your pitch uh, 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 why people should attempt to reproduce it. And then you can add some extra guidance on what people should focus on if need be. And then links to uh, your resources, paper, code, uh, data, if it's additional or any extra URLs. And then very important as well are uh, tags. And this is to help people um, uh, either look for a domain or a specific tool. Uh, it just makes it papers more findable. Okay, finally, this is where you can select whether you want your reviews public or not and your notifications. And you can change this at any point. You can come in and change it uh, later on if you want. And finally, if you've had enough and you don't want any more reviews, you can just uh, archive the paper. Uh, one thing to note is that if you, sorry, if say you've associated it with a specific event, if you go down to the bottom, uh, it also, uh, um, you can select whether you want it available for review at all, any future events or only available at an associated event, at that event, right? So you can submit a paper that you only want looked at in a, in a specific event. Um, okay, that's it. I think uh, done. We can just chat now. Whew, I got through it. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, let me know what you thought of this speed. <laughs> you know, normally we take a little bit more time to uh, go through the slides, for example, the introductory slides, so you can see um, in more detail sort of how we introduce the event uh, and have a lot more time for chat. But um, yeah, if there's any questions or comments, I'd, I'm happy to take them now. Uh, feel free to just unmute because I can't see everyone if anyone's got their hand up. Yeah, I, there. I was just uh, wondering uh, what sort of ratio you recommended for sort of organizers and participants? Uh, okay, so uh, I've actually done them myself on my own with maybe maximum 12, 13 participants. Mm -hmm. Actually, what recommend is engaging RSEs as support, just to be there. The, firstly, they find, uh, so research software engineers for uh, anyone not familiar. Um, so they love the activity actually, and they are incredible support for other people. So they really can help with debugging, um, especially on different systems. Uh, so one thing I would, I, I think you don't need necessarily too many, um, you know, one person can do this because as an organizer, you're not doing too much. You're, you're guiding the activity, you're introducing it initially. Uh, it's nice to have support, but one person can do it. It's more, um, in terms of technical support, it's nice to have some RSC. So if you do have an RSC team at your you know, institution, definitely reach out to them because uh, they can be uh, yeah, really useful as, as support. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the, oh yes, Vicky. I was going to ask, um, so obviously, as the core team, we've run a number of these events, but has anyone run an event like 
basically what you've taken us through there to the team, like they've done a separate one. Yes. <laughs> so, well, this Swiss Reaper hack that's coming up is someone else's event. I think that's the second or third using this hub. So before, oh, right, this hub was uh, launched in November, 2021. So a few, maybe half a year ago, I guess, or a little bit more now. Uh, or no, anyways, <laughs> um, but before that we had, we did have sort of materials that we, uh, we uh, that people could use, like we used a Shiny app, which is a R uh, framework and uh, had tried, we tried to make it reproducible, but it was a pain for other people to replicate. So some people had even done that. Maybe we had four or five of people, um, groups that had tried to do it with the old infrastructure. Um, but now this should be much simpler with the, with the, that's why we're trying to now run more of these train the trainer events. But yeah, the Swiss one coming up is a new one and hopefully maybe you'll consider, I think Durham have got in touch and they're, um, they're preparing to do one as well. And I think leads are in the process of planning one as well. Nice, yeah, no, it seems really cool. Um, definitely will consider it. Hopefully it shouldn't take too much work now to set it up. And uh, any, we do have right on the hub, it is still in beta. Uh, so uh, yeah, feel free to add open issues in our repository for with any suggestions. All right. Well, I mean, if, if no one has anything uh, else, you can have some coffee, <laughs> grab some coffee. Right, Mario, what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah but, but before we go, can we all give um, Anna a virtual applause? Thank you very much, Anna, for doing this. Uh, no worries. And, and, um,